Dun 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 da 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 bum 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 ba da bum bum. I cannot be the only one that had that song playing in my head as the ships were popping out of the water. I like how Oda decided to block the faces of the supernova with speech bubbles as they were arriving. Like maybe he thought, oh, maybe if I hide their face, they won't know who just showed up. Or maybe he just wanted to save the reveal for that triple panel by the end, for it to be more impactful. Out of the three, I have to say that Law has the best entrance. The way his submarine just comes out of the water, like it's the Flying Dutchman from Pirates of the Caribbean. It picks up that little boat, and then Law's all like, Oi, Samurai, uh, you underestimated the sea. Man, I'm smooth. Now, in terms of the traitor reveal, which was something that people were talking and thinking about week by week with each chapter as Oda, you know, sprinkled the hints, I, I, there were a couple of uh, people that I never suspected. If the traitor was going to be a scabbard, there were characters within that group that I never suspected in the first place. Like, I never suspected it to be Kawamatsu, Ashura Doji, or Denjiro. I thought those three were safe. Um, so I, I always, and I didn't think it would be Kinemon ever because Kinemon, like, he would have killed Momonosuke a long time ago if, if he were to be the traitor. So I think for the most part, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think for the most part, our suspicions were with either Raizo, Kiku, and Kanjiro. I think those were the three that if the traitor had to be a scabbard, it would have to be one of those three. So there was some discussion regarding the possibility of Kanjiro being the traitor. That discussion was floating around, but it's it's one thing to think about it, it's one thing to discuss it hypothetically, than to actually see it happen. As the story progressed, especially with Odin, I kind of felt like the, the Chris Pratt meme, you know, the one from Parks and Rec that says, I don't know who the traitor is, and at this point, I'm afraid to ask. And it made sense too, because out of the scabbards, I feel like Kanjiro was the one with the most blank personality, like the one that could be molded into being the traitor. So, so, you know, you have some doubts, you have some suspicions, but to actually see his face going like, I am the traitor. That's right, me, Kanjiro, the most forgettable of the scabbards. Oh, this is for real now. Yikes. If you remember back when Odin recruits Kanjiro for the first time, when he's recruiting the scabbards, he recruits Kanjiro uh, and he describes him as like a weirdo that was essentially like cutting people's hair off and not just like living people. Like he would cut off the hair of people that are already dead and he would use that hair to make brushes, to sell brushes for a living. But in his journal entry, Odin also writes that Kanjiro was persecuted in the past. This is the kind of stuff that adds a different type of perspective to the story. So from now on, whenever it is you reread stuff with Kanjiro, it's just gonna seem very, very weird and really, really shady. Like if you go back to Dress Rosa, there are multiple instances where he's pretending to help. Like he made this really crappy ladder to help people escape from one of the lower levels in Dress Rosa. He also technically pushed or help pushed the birdcage. Just details like that that make you look at it and, and think about how messed up it was that he was pretending to, to help the people that he was selling out, right? He technically also helped Usopp defeat Sugar because if you remember, the ammunition that Usopp fires at Sugar to make her faint that silly drawing of Usopp was drawn by Kanjiro. So it's crazy the lengths that this guy went. It's just so creepy. It's really bizarre. We have Gotti in the cover page there, and it seems like he successfully was able to rescue Chiffon. Uh, but back in chapter 958, there's a guy with a guitar at the entrance of Dress Rosa who tells uh, Chiffon and Capone that Lola was in Dress Rosa not too long ago. So I wonder, wouldn't it be funny if the, the person who Gotti saved is actually Lola instead of Chiffon, and he got them mixed up. Now the first page of this chapter is actually explaining to us what went down during that scene at the palace with Orochi. If you remember during that party with Orochi, Orochi was really upset at Toko because she couldn't stop laughing at him. So Orochi wanted to kill Toko, but then Komurasaki stepped in to confront Orochi. She actually goes, as far as to slap him in the face, and this infuriates Orochi even further. So Orochi orders Komurasaki to be to be killed, 
And that's when Kyoshiro steps in and he pretends to kill her, right? And the scene makes it look like, you know, he actually wounded her. But now when you reread that part, it's obvious that she's just releasing the blood that he told her to carry with her just in case. I also think Denjiro makes a really good point about how hard it must have been for Komurasaki to be hanging around Orochi and you know being flirtatious and I don't know what else they did but that, that's just really messed up. Imagine how much trauma Hiyori has lived through. It's like she's getting a room with the person who killed her father. So I'm just going to do the same thing that the chapter does, which is kind of like give you like a very brief refresher about Kanjiro stuff. So essentially, uh, if you remember, after the 20 year time jump, Kinemon says that after that jump, they were headed to Zo. And if you remember in the last chapter, Odin was hyping up Zo. He was saying like, when the time comes, go to Zo. Those are powerful allies. They're our friends. So seek them out. So once they jump into the future, Kiku stays behind in Wano to gather information and the rest of the group set sail to Zo. Unfortunately, the group of four gets shipwrecked, and then they get separated from Raizo, and that's how Raizo ends up in Zo. After that, Kinemon, Kanjido, and Momonosuke end up in Dressrosa, and then are chased by Doflamingo. Now, Momonosuke tries to hide aboard a ship, and that ship sets sail to Punk Hazard, and Kinemon has to chase after it. Now, the messed up thing here is that as Kinemon and Kanjido are trying to chase after Momonosuke, Kanjido gets caught by Doflamingo's men, and Kinemon is left with the impression that Kanjido sacrificed himself so that he could go on ahead to find and save Momonosuke. So this raises the question of whether or not Doflamingo actually knew that Kanjido was working for Kaido and Orochi. I'm, I'm pretty much betting that he did know, because he didn't do anything to hurt Kanjido. It's really strange, like if you rewatch the reunion between Kinemon and Kanjido in the anime, Kinemon is just so happy to see his friend. Like he's crying tears of joy, because he was so worried about him after they parted ways. And Kanjido, on the other hand, is just so emotionless. It's just like, oh, yeah, here I am, you know sorry that you had to look for me, but he just doesn't, you know, emote anything. Another messed up thing is that there's a moment in Dressrosa where Kinemon could have fought some of Dofi's men, but he doesn't fight them because he finds out that Kanjido has been taken hostage. Also, when the crew is nearing Zo, pretty much everybody on the ship is pretty amazed at the new island, and Kanjido is the only one that says, hey, I've heard that this place has a tribe that hates humans. So he's just planting the seeds of animosity there. And then, of course, we find out that it was Kanjiro who led Jack to Zo. And as he's explaining himself, Kanjiro makes a reference to this scene back in Zo where Inarashi begins to be suspicious. And this is actually the very first scene that we get from Oda that introduces us to the idea that there is a traitor within the Allied forces. And despite Robin falling in love with Ryonosuke, we now know that Kanjiro was pretending to not know how to draw because the clone that appears in this chapter was just masterfully drawn. So I thought that technique to fool the reader that Oda used was very clever. Very clever idea because I think Oda knew that most fans would just assume that that ability was a gag, right? That this was a joke and, oh, look at Kanjiro and his gag drawings. So in other words, Oda used his own humor to trick us. He used our expectations on his humor to trick us. There's a moment in Wano where Frankie is running around trying to find the blueprints for Onigashima and he runs into Kanjiro and Kanjiro asks what's wrong and Frankie tells him. And so because of this, this means that Kaido and Orochi know that the Straw Hats were after the blueprints of Onigashima. So I wouldn't be surprised if Kaido and Orochi possibly set some traps at Onigashima for the Straw Hats since they know that they were after the blueprints. In addition, in chapter 934, Robin holds a meeting in Ringo Kanjiro is also part of that meeting, and Robin talks about all of the information she's been able to gather while pretending to be a geisha. And in that meeting, Brooke also reveals that he found a poneglyph in the basement of the palace, you know, the one guarded by the Kokeshi dolls. And then Robin says that if that's the case, then she's pretty much sure that the road poneglyph they're looking for is in Onigashima Island. So I wouldn't be surprised either if Kanjiro told this to Orochi and Kaido, and now they had those poneglyphs moved to another location. Also, in chapter 940, there's like a secret meeting with some of the Alliance members inside of a house, uh, in Ibizu town and Kanjiro is there and Yasui walks in and he says that he's going to pledge his support to the Alliance, that he's ready to fight with them. And then immediately after that happens, it's when we find out that Yasui has been caught 
and that he's been scheduled to be publicly executed. And as mentioned in this chapter, Kanjiro also sold out Law's crew and got them thrown in prison. But in chapter 951, Law actually makes a deal with Hawkins to turn himself in to take their place instead, so Beppo and the others get set free. And it's in that same chapter, chapter 951, where we see Kanjiro walking away with Lord Yasui's body, because he says that he's going to bury him and give him the proper honors. So imagine if there's like a plot twist moment where the scabbards are confronting Kanjiro about what he did with Lord Yasui's body. What unspeakable messed up things did you do with the body? And then Kanjiro's like, no, I, I actually did bury him. I, I took my role very seriously as an actor. Now, I actually saw this post on Reddit that had a panel from chapter 920. So if you go back to chapter 920 uh, and you look at the moment where the scabbards arrive at the present after the 20 year time jump, you'll see Kanjiro with his brush and above him, you'll see some birds floating around. And the design of those birds looks very similar to the type of birds that we've seen Kanjiro draw before, specifically in Dressrosa. So I think what this person was implying is that immediately after the time jump, Kanjiro sent word to Orochi about the fact that they had leaped 20 years into the future. And so it could also be that the letter that Orochi is reading in this chapter was carried by one of those birds. Now in that same scene where Orochi is reading the letter, we find out, we get an explanation for as to why, uh, despite Orochi having a traitor within the scabbards, the scabbards were still immune to being killed. It's because Kaido asked Orochi not to kill them because he wanted to interrogate the scabbards to find out more about Laugh Tale. We find out more about Kanjiro via a flashback. At first I was so confused because in the flashback, Kanjiro is like a like a dark blob. It reminded me of those uh, those soul monster blob things from Whole Cake Island. You know the ones that collect the lifespan of the residents. That's what it reminded me of. But I think that was just kind of like a, a figurative sort of uh, blob because Oda didn't want to reveal the traitor in those scenes yet. So that's why we get that weird silhouette thing. Uh, but anyway, I also like how Kanjiro's devil fruit. Looks like it's been painted with ink. Turns out Kanjido's parents were killed on stage because of the generational grudge that went back to Orochi's grandfather because he was killing the daimyo to obtain power. So he's a victim of that generational grudge. And so he gets recruited by Orochi as well as Higurashi and the old man. So essentially the same type of injustice and persecution that ended up pushing Orochi towards evil right, is the same type of persecution and injustice that made Kanjiro evil, in a sense. And I think, like, it, because it's such a repetitive theme now with both of these characters, I think that this is an issue and this is a, a, a plot point that needs to be addressed either by the end of Wano or by the end of the series. That being said, I think one of the most important parts of this explanation from Orochi as he's talking to Kaido is when Orochi says that Kanjiro would give Orochi money. When Orochi would go to Odin to ask for money, Kanjiro would give him double the amount. And it was thanks to these funds that Orochi was able to strike a deal with Kaido. So when I read that, I was like, whoa, so this is just a business relationship, essentially. You pay Kaido for his services, for his protection. But what's going to happen when you can't pay Kaido? Because I think it could very well be the case that Kaido may not even like Orochi and that he's only providing his services because he's being paid for them. Orochi then talks about how Kanjiro was actually willing to give up his life during the execution just to go along with his role, which, you know, if you glance back at those panels, it's just super messed up. Like the way that he's pretending to care and, you know, he's just like crying and apparently missing Odin and all that stuff. Just really messed up. It's like... It's like he stopped being a human being, right? And I think that's what the blob represented in a way. Now, even before this chapter, we saw that Shinobu was entrusted with taking care of Momonosuke at the shore. So the scabbards pretty much left the two of them behind because Momonosuke was not going to sail with them. And Momonosuke was actually crying out to the scabbards to come back because he wanted the date of the invasion to be changed. But Kinemon was like, no, like we can't do that anymore. It's too late. It's now or never. I just think about how desperate Kinemon must feel to think that they could actually go to Onigashima Island and kill Kaido with a sword. With a sword. Given what we know about Kaido, about how like 
guillotines have broken. I feel like there was a Naruto substitute shadow clone jutsu move that I didn't understand in the sequence where Kanjiro switches himself for Shinobu. Well, I mean, if you think about it, Kanjiro is essentially Sai gone wrong, but there's a moment where we see Shinobu holding Momonosuke, Kinemon slashes the ink clone, and then all of a sudden Kanjiro is where Shinobu was. So I think uh, either Kanjiro drew a Shinobu clone so that 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 clone would pretend to hold Momonosuke and the real Shinobu is somewhere else, or maybe Shinobu knew that this was going to happen and she is hiding to surprise Kanjiro to save Momonosuke. And I, and I say this because, I, I've said this before, but I think, and it becomes much more clear with Luffy's arrival. The Alliance knew that there was a traitor. If you look at this as a chess match, Orochi made a move, but the Alliance already knew that Orochi was going to make this move. Otherwise, Luffy would not have shown up in this chapter. So the Straw Hat Alliance must have predicted that Kanjiro and Orochi would do this. So it wouldn't be too crazy to think that maybe this whole thing is actually done by the scabbards on purpose to actually weed out the traitor. I think Law could technically use shambles, right? To switch himself for Kanjido so that Kanjido ends up on the submarine and then later gets tackled by the scabbards and then Law ends up with Momonosuke and that way Momonosuke gets free. We see the beast pirate ship closing in on the little boat and all of a sudden we hear Oh, yeah. I kid you not, when I saw the sunny jumping on those waves, I could literally feel the water, the ocean water hitting me in the face. Luffy says that he's been well fed and well rested, so he's coming in on this invasion at full HP. Full HP against Kaido. There's also a comment about the, the, the ship being fixed, so I'm guessing that's a reference to the sunny possibly suffering some damages during the, the bombing of it. You know, when Orochi was taking care of the bridges, maybe it did get damaged, but Frankie was able to fix it in time. Luffy also apologizes for being a little late because he fell asleep, but I think this is also Oda's way of apologizing to the reader for the flashback taking as long as it did to get back to the present. I love how everybody's yelling at each other throughout their entrance. Oi! Jaggy, you made it! Yeah, you're crazy if you think I'm gonna let you take all the credit for taking down Kaido Mugiwara. Fire, fire, shoom, shoom. Kid says that he saw a fleet on his way there, so I'm pretty sure that means that the plans were changed last minute. Instead of sailing from Port Tokage, the, the fleet was going to sail from Port Habu, which was the port that they initially intended to sail from. And according to the Library of O'Hara, Kid's ship is called the Victoria Punk. And it's fascinating because if you look at the front, it's supposed to be like a, the skull of a dinosaur, right? With rib cages on the side and stuff. But the reason why it's called Victoria is because it also has a Victorian Gothic theme to it as well. And then, of course, we have Law's Yellow Submarine, inspired by the Beatles. It's a weird thing, like, I always forget that he has a submarine until it shows up on screen. And then I'm like, oh yeah, Law does have a submarine. But anyway, the sub is called Polar Tang. And it's called Polar because Law's crew has a polar animal theme to it. Beppo is a polar bear, Shachi is a killer whale, Penguin is, well, you know what Penguin is. And then Law is supposed to be either a snow leopard or a leopard seal. There's some confusion as to which animal it is that he's supposed to represent. So that's why it's called polar. And then Tang, the Tang part is because a Tang is a fish, and Tangs are also known as surgeon fish because they have spines that are very sharp. I thought we were actually gonna see Luffy show up wearing his samurai armor, but instead he has a new coat with the collar up. Reminds me of the, the coat that he was wearing during Strong World when he invaded Shiki's palace. It kind of gives him that Roger feel. I like how you see the three ships gradually enter formation to get into battle. Because when you're at sea, you fight pirates. <laughs> That's it for me. Thank you so much for watching. I thought the chapter was great. Great, great setup chapter. Great revealed chapter as well. Awesome stuff. Gets you hyped for what's to come next. Man, like, Oda has been on a roll. Like, these chapters have been great, great in terms of quality. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, you know what to do. If you haven't subscribed yet, you know the thing. And congratulations to those of you who actually thought and predicted that Kanjiro would be the traitor. Because you got it right. Can't wait to see what happens next. Catch you later. Take care. Do-do-do-do-do.
Pom, pom, pom. Pom, pom, pom.